Most of Canada folded together around the same time, except for Newfoundland who joined 85 years later. I'm going to try to be fair on this because there are still people alive who are citizens of an independent Newfoundland. In the first, Newfoundland is an island, and also attached to Canada. This area is called Newfoundland. This island is called Newfoundland. This landmass over here is called Labrador. It's part of Newfoundland, the country, not the island. In 1809, Labrador was sectioned off from the province of Canada and given to the colony of Newfoundland. Until the 1940s, this part of the country was just where the Montsonnet and Escapi Inuit lived. After this point, it became a mining colony of Newfoundland, the island, not the country. In 1864, Newfoundland sent two men to a delegation for the formation of Canada. However, mass movement against confederation in Newfoundland rose, and in 1869, a new government was formed, forever isolating Newfoundland from the new country of Canada. Newfoundland, instead, asks to become a separate and independent country from England. And with that, the Dominion of Newfoundland lives side by side with the Dominion of Canada. Newfoundland was a young and blossoming republic, with a vast amount of wealth from its sea trade. However, during the Great Depression, Newfoundland had amounted $40 million in debt, and neither Canada nor England would loan the government of Newfoundland a penny. Now keep in mind, both Canada and England were giving out loans to everyone around the world, bailing out almost every single country in the world. England was even giving money to Nazi Germany. But no loans were coming for Newfoundland. Instead, Canadian Prime Minister Mackenzie King signed a wave of tariffs against Newfoundland that made the problems worse. The British believed that it was all caused by mismanagement of Newfoundland government, nothing at all to do with the global recession. If you believe Newfoundland was sold to Canada, this is a good sign it might be true. Three British ministers and three Newfoundland ministers met in a panel. The two sides agreed that the British would set up a commission that would run the country and after it moved back into profitability, they would hand back over control of Newfoundland. This is really unprecedented in history of the world. England was bailing out all of their former colonies, but for whatever reason, Newfoundland was under their thumb. The Commission of Newfoundland saw the beginning of the rule of magistrates, who were often patronage positions from English lords. The island would remain under colonial control from 1934 until 1945. These magistrates would not spend a dollar on public infrastructure, but instead all tax revenues would be collected and placed in a central fund. This was rather unusual treatment for a colony. Most colonies were reinvested in for higher profits for the mother country, but in this case, it was different. However, in 1939, a major world event would change Newfoundland's fortunes. World War II. That boy Hitler, who the English were giving loans, was using that money to take over Europe. And he wasn't even going to pay back the loans. The Newfoundland Regiment had been wiped out in World War I and was not present in World War II. Only those volunteers who chose to join the British forces would serve in World War II. In 1941, the British government signed leases with the United States to build air bases in Newfoundland. One would be built in Steenville and another built in Gander. With the arrival of the Americans' money began pouring in and friendly trade relations with the United States led to an increased demand for the province's plentiful fish. While the war was going on, the Commission of Newfoundland was posting giant surpluses every single year. America was seen as the saviors of Newfoundland and this caused a bridge between traditional British and Newfoundland relations. With the war years being what they were, a need by the British to maintain overseas funds happened in case there was a need to supplement their war costs. A popular theory showing that Newfoundland was eventually manipulated into confederation shows that the lump sum of money was held as an incentive to trade Newfoundland to another nation. Perhaps Canada, who owned a large segment of British war debt. Regardless, the money never did get transferred to Newfoundland and stayed in a British trust. When World War II ended and Newfoundland was now a highly profitable colony, the fate of the country had once again come into a question. England no longer wished to simply give Newfoundland back to her people, but instead asked them to decide their fate via referendum. Referendum has an opportunity for vote manipulation. In the Quebec referendum, the Canadian government spent a disproportionately high amount of money on advertising to scare Quebec voters into a voting non. 
uh, where the fate of Newfoundland wasn't set in stone. The American bases in Newfoundland was literally a marriage of cultures. Thousands of young Newfoundland women had married American soldiers and American servicemen. There was now a sizable number of Newfoundlanders who were interested in becoming a United State. The thought of being surrounded by America was absolutely frightening to Canada. In the past, they had rejected Newfoundland's pleas for help, but now they were sitting at the table. Mackenzie King began trying to make a bid to have Newfoundland join Confederation with Canada. King had no interest in the province and felt he would be adopting Newfoundland's debt rather than picking up a precious property. But the idea that a U.S. state might control access to Canadian shipping routes was terrifying. Mackenzie King found an ally in Joseph R. Smallwood. Joseph Smallwood was born with a smooth tongue, able to convince anyone of anything. His command of the English language was superior to most Canadian politicians and judges. Mackenzie King decided to bankroll Smallwood's campaign for Confederation. On the table were the options to stay with England, become an independent country, join Confederation with Canada, or become a U.S. state. On the first ballot, England was the least popular vote and was removed from the next ballot. British lords met with Mackenzie King to make sure that Newfoundland would not become a U.S. state. The Great Conspiracy was now coming full circle and there was a real incentive for Newfoundland to go to Canada. The leading vote was to join the United States. Despite this, there wasn't any real interest in the United States to actually adopt Newfoundland. Not one US penny was lobbied towards Newfoundland Confederation. America certainly would have accepted Newfoundland as another territory, but as a US state, uh, probably not. Joey Smallwood at this time began a tour of Newfoundland. Newfoundland had no roads across the country linking east to west. Smallwood went from community to community via boat, convincing the locals to throw their vote behind Newfoundland. In many parts of the country, people weren't even aware there was a referendum going on, and Smallwood was charting remote communities that people weren't even aware existed. Simultaneously, the two separate movements were campaigning for independence for the colony. These two groups were based out of the colony's capital, St. John's, where over half of the recorded population lived. Peter Cashin and the Responsible Government League was the most popular and would spend a lot of time on the radio speaking directly to the people about conspiracy theories about these events. Cashin came from a long line of men of government who many accused of being in the pockets of the merchants. The Merchants of Newfoundland were a cartel of price-fixing fish merchants. Newfoundlanders would place orders at their local merchant shop. Think of it as like a convenience store that imports what you need and exports what you sell. The price of what you would sell would always be set up so that there was always a tab to pay off. The difference between buying and selling. Most Newfoundlanders didn't have a dollar to their name and in the years that followed, they would blame the merchants. The second group was the Economic Union Party, led by Chesley Crosby. The Crosby family were a bit of royalty in Newfoundland. His father, John, was premier of the province. His son, John, was the most successful, having been a minister under both Liberal and PC premiers, as well as a minister in Joe Clark and Brian Mulroney's federal governments. Smallwood was against some tough opposition. On the second ballot, independence had become the top vote and joined the United States had fallen to third place. The final vote would be between Newfoundland joining Confederation or remaining an independent government. In the end, Confederation had won. Joey Smallwood's well-oiled political machine had convinced 52% of Newfoundlanders to vote in favor of Confederation. In the first general election, Joey Smallwood was ushered in as the first premier of the province. Smallwood ran unopposed for 23 straight years until eventually another party could gain enough support to replace him. He is the second longest serving premier in Canadian history. His first action as premier was to kick all the merchants out of the province and pass laws outlawing price fixing behaviors. 
In 1989, a new interprovincial theory was given the name the Joseph and Clara Smallwood, in remembrance of the last surviving father of Confederation. Joey Smallwood led the province through a process of modernization. But that's a story for another time.